If you come up with a canon law solution that isn't pastoral, you've probably got it wrong. We try to be as unusual as we possibly can be. Yeah. Well, that's a very good question. How do we be church together mm. rather than how do we how do we let you in if we decide we want to? Mm. Everybody, welcome back to another Christ Alive episode number four. So excited to be back. Today we have Father Justin Glenn with us to speak about the church and disabilities and people with disabilities. So I'm really excited about that conversation, how as usual. I'm very excited as well. Um, keen to hear about like how we can journey together with people rather than sort of thinking about us and them. Yeah, yeah like so they're not part of the community like and you're trying yeah, exactly. to bring them yeah. in. So it's going to be a very, very interesting conversation. See you inside. Welcome back, everybody. Um, as you know, my name is Karabo Rishogete Ramayla, and I am your... Sean Nicholas Finstaden. And our guest today is Father... Justin Glynn. How are you, Father? You I am very well indeed, thank you. You're good self. I'm awesome. So, Father, could you just introduce yourself? Tell us a bit more about who you are, where do you come from, where, do you, where did you grow up, what do you do? Just give us a preview. preview. So many complicated questions in one hit. (laughs) I am a Jesuit. Mm -hmm. I'm a priest. I grew up in South Africa. And I practiced law in South Africa for a while. And then I moved with my family to New Zealand, where I also practiced law for a bit and did a doctorate. And then um, I got the... It was kind of an ongoing call, but there was very much a, an urgency to it. And so once I finished the doctorate, I joined the Jesuits. And I went to Australia because there weren't any Jesuit formation places in New Zealand. And I did my novitiate for two years. I studied philosophy and theology went working with refugees for a year as part of what we call Regency, which is basically a period between our study in the middle of our studies. Finished my theology and they said, well, you know, we haven't got a canon lawyer. So a canon lawyer is basically somebody who does church law. Oh. So I went and did canon law in Ottawa in Canada and had wonderful times in Ottawa and worked up with some indigenous communities in the far north, which was great um, during my studies, Mm -hmm. and then came back to Australia and worked basically as both sorts of lawyers. So I worked as a a civil lawyer, so I worked as a lawyer in dealing with Australian law for the province, and also worked as a canon lawyer and taught seminarians canon law, and also worked a bit in other areas, um, pastoral work, a bit of work doing stuff in some of the parishes and things and working with going visiting aged care centers, as well as writing in the area of theology of disability. So now what I'm doing is what we call tertianship. Jesuits are strange in many ways. One of them is that we actually take our final vows quite a long time after we get ordained. And the step before final vows is what's called tertianship. So tertia, tertia, Latin three. So it's our third probation. It's like a scrunched up mini novitiate where we go on retreat again. We look at the history of the society and the and um, look at our constitutions. And then we um, go back to our home countries and we then, after a while, God willing, um, the general invites us to take final vows. Oh, so it's not like a lot of congregations where you take your final vows before no. ordination. No, no. We're, we're, we're very unusual like that. <laughs> we try to be as unusual as we possibly can be. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> keeps things interesting. It keeps things interesting. <laughs> it does indeed. <laughs> Ignatius got like endless dispensations for us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and um, for, for, for perspective, I'm, I'm also in the Regency, that stage that you mentioned, yeah. sort of between the philosophy and theology. Um, 
So I've still got a long way to go before I, I reach before traditional shoes. Yeah. <laughs> well, Father, um, yeah, you mentioned that canon law is like church law, but yep. how big of a difference is it between that and just civil? Look, it varies. So mm. canon law is quite like, in some ways, quite like South African law, because like South African law, a lot of it is based on Roman law. So you find that actually I found that a lot of the concepts were very similar. But so it is it is kind of based on Roman law, but it deals with areas that deals with some areas that you deal with in mainstream legal settings like property and um, dealing with things like marriage, those sort of things. You'll find those in normal areas, but it deals with some stuff that you don't ever touch in um, and, and the mainstream legal systems are not interested in like. What are the laws around reception of the Eucharist? What are the laws around joining religious life, leaving religious life? All that kind of stuff, which, um, you know, mainstream legal systems, that, that that's not their, really their concern. Mm -hmm. But it's it's also a bit unlike legal systems in, in of countries because fundamentally it is pastoral. It's based on the theology. I like to tell my classes that this is canon law is administrative theology. It's making our theology practical. Mm -hmm. So if you come up with a canon law solution that isn't pastoral, you've probably got it wrong. Mm. Oh, okay. Mm. That's interesting. I've, I've never heard canon law described in that trait of theology. Yeah. Um, I've always thought about it as the kind of legalistic kind yeah, of side of things. That yeah, that can get a problem. Some people mm. do treat it like that, and mm. then you really run into all sorts of problems. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you really can't do it that way. Not you, you don't do it justice that way anyway. And and you've sort of been practicing both um, in your Absolutely. ministerial life. Yeah. So I've been doing a bit of both in my ministerial life. Um, we've been doing looking a lot. In fact, a lot of my background um, was in corporate law. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that has come up quite a lot because in in Australia, we've been looking at how we make the province more open and how do we make it more accountable. Yeah. So both to the, so that the civil legal structures can see what we're doing. And so that, for example, God forbid, if people need to, uh, you know, if people have been feel they've been wronged by the Jesuits, they know which entity to sue. And, you know, also because the Jesuits ourselves have passed recently in general congregations laws that have said things like, you know, we need to make sure that our governance is open and transparent. We've actually just passed a new set of regulations on administration of funds. Mm. And that's part of that whole thing as well of making the whole system open, transparent mm. and visible mm. and trying to. Yeah, like any legal system, you've got to every day life as you go along and their changes, things don't stay the same. Mm. I think that's a really important movement in the church because mm. we've really struggled with transparency and accountability. Yeah. I mean, yeah. in the child yeah. abuse scandal, exactly. Um, I think we really got that part of it wrong. Yeah. Um, but For hopefully sure. these sort of changes help us to... And worse get yet, the cover-ups right. that came with the abuse yeah. scandal. Mm. Has there been sort of concrete change, at least maybe... In, in your context, in the oh, Australian context? Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, we mm. have now a, a guy who's responsible for professional standards is, in fact, totally independent um, in a sense that, I mean, he's still, he's still got a contract with the Jesuits to handle complaints and issues, and he's obviously got access to Jesuit computer systems and things. Mm -hmm. But he is not himself a Jesuit. He's an ex-policeman. Mm. He's got a history and a background of working in abuse cases. So we've actually got a, you know, there's these things are at arm's length. So it's not, mm. you know, so there, and that is a bonus. Mm. That helps, yeah. So um, how, I don't know how to phrase this, but how does, how how do you think that church has been inclusive towards people with various uh, disabilities? Well, that's a very good question, and the answer is that it hasn't, largely because the theology until very recently was a bit confused. On the one hand, the church said, well, people with disabilities um, are kind of suffering from the after effects of original sin, in which case you go, okay, so what was that whole baptism thing all about again? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, people have said things like, oh, well, you see, they're blessed to suffer. 
um, which of course <laughs> is pretty gross and doesn't actually reflect the way that most people, most disabled people understand our lives yeah. either. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think more and more we're coming to see that disability is, disability is largely social. Yeah. And when I say that, I mean, a lot of people will have an impairment in something. And mm -hmm. let's face it, you're born legally blind, incontinent, without much ability to say much of anything. And if you live long enough, you probably die that way. <laughs> yes. We, so We go out the way we came in. <laughs> exactly. So we, we have our limits. And that's and, and, the, and the, the, the human capacities vary over our lifetimes. And people have different limits. But unfortunately, society makes the decision to exclude people with some sets of limits. And that's maybe not... It's a, it sounds a funny way to put it, but if you think about it, it's pretty true. If you don't have ramps to buildings, mm. uh, you don't have stuff in alternative print formats, you're basically saying that, well, if you can't see or you can't walk, well, yeah, you needn't apply, really. Mm. And so, and I mean, you think about it, actually a wonderful proof of what this is, this is the so-called social model of disability, is the COVID pandemic. People said in the early 2000s and things, well, wait, now we've got video conferencing technology. Can we do our lectures and work from home? Nah, way too expensive. You can't do that. Can we get soup, you know, goods delivered from the supermarket? Nah, way too expensive. You can't do that. All of a sudden, there's a pandemic. Everybody's at home. Sure, you can do it. Everybody <laughs> has to. Mm. Then all of a sudden, People have decided that enough people are inoculated. You can send people back to work. Nah, way too expensive. You can't do that. Mm. So, you know, it's a classic proof of the concept. Mm -hmm. So the old idea, the medical model of, the, of disability, which says you have a problem, there's something wrong with you, and therefore we won't include you, is really very much, I think, now being replaced by a much more socially minded thing, which says, look, Society makes a decision as to what impairments it accommodates. Yeah. And then when it decides not to accommodate those impairments, you have a disability because mm -hmm. suddenly you're at a disadvantage to other people. Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of a shift from the old way of thinking. We're saying like the problem is with the person yeah. because they are limited in this way or that way. But now we're kind of realizing the problem is with society, society. In, in sort of finding ways of um, giving access and inclusion to people who have a different degree of limitation. Uh, you've said before that everybody's limited. Exactly. Um, just to different extents. And that's, you know, hence Pope Francis talks about a lot. He's often used it in, co in connection with aging. But of course, as mm. I say, aging and disability are two sides of the same coin. Pope Francis has talked a lot about the magisterium of fragility. The idea that actually people's fragileness, um, incapacity, people's incapacities, can actually teach us quite a lot about what it means to get on together, to live together, to work mm. together. Mm. And that's part of the stuff I've been writing on and exploring the consequences about. Because mm. I also believe that now we're trying to be more inclusive. That's what we say. But you can only be inclusive to an extent that you understand. So I will assume that for me to be an inclusive to a blind person, I need to do this and this yep. and this, but that's not really what you need. So how do we create that balance where I'm actually being inclusive without being ignorant? And I think it's, it's a good question, but I think perhaps the rhetoric of inclusion is maybe not the right one mm -hmm. because it still sets up an us and a them. Yes. There's an us that's basically going to let you in. Mm -hmm. And how do we do that? Hmm. I think the, the, the thing is that we're all us. And the question is then how do all of our people get to participate? Mm -hmm. And that also requires listening to what people have to say. Because as you say, I mean, I don't know all the needs of everybody who has a disability or has other needs, whether it be language needs or mm -hmm. whatever else. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's it's really a case of consulting to making sure that everybody, that there's as wide a range of people making decisions as possible. And that the people who are doing stuff listen to each other. And in that sense, it actually dovetails very nicely with the whole concept of synodality, which is currently very much part of our understanding at the moment. So yes. synodality, synhodos, we're on the road together. 
And if we're all on the road together, then we all really have to listen to each other and work out what we need and how we can work with each other. Mm. Because all of us will have different limitations, different needs, Mm -hmm. different abilities, different strengths, different weaknesses. Mm. And if we can supplement all of these and work together, then we're actually genuinely on the road together rather than dragging somebody behind us in the cart. Mm. Um, which was expressed kind of nicely in the logo of the Synod on Synodality. Exactly. I think there was actually someone in a wheelchair. There was indeed, in yes. That, yeah, and, and, and in, in amongst the crowd, not yeah, sort of yeah, exactly. out in front or at the back. Yeah, 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 yeah sort exactly. Of with, yeah. Yeah, really together. That's exactly right. Yeah. And so I think that's that's exactly right. So you do have the whole, how do we be church together rather mm. than how do, we, how do we let you in if we decide we want church. to? Mm-hmm. Yeah. As if, as if the able or less limited people are the ones who decide yeah, <laughs> who's in a, who's out anyway. Yes. Yeah, 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 exactly. yeah, this is it, you know. Yeah. Um, could, could you describe the nature of your own disability? Sure. I mean, I have a, um, I have a nystagmus, the eyes, and I've had it since birth. So what's happened is that I, there's a part, when I was really in the womb, there was a part of the brain that didn't form up properly. Mm-hmm. It's pressing on the optic nerves. So whether the camera can see it, I don't know. The eyes jump back and forth. They can't focus on anything. So the world is a fuzzy blur and has been for always. Mm. I've also got short sight um, and probably due to the same issue that gave rise to the blindness. There's also um, a, a, I'm also epileptic, which has been under control by medication. So that those are those are really the um, it's 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 a it's a it's a bit of a combo really. Mm-hmm. So there's the world's a fuzzy blur, which means that I have very little vision. Mm-hmm. The telescopes give me a little bit of they they allow me to they inflate the blur in a small area, so I can use what vision I have in a small area, mm-hmm. and then I have a white cane over there which I use for mine sweeping. So that <laughs> when I'm looking ahead of me, I can work out what's going on and not fall into the manhole in front mm. of me. Mm. So how how was that growing up? Uh, well, in fact, I didn't get the telescopes till later on. And growing up was, I mean, it, I had a lovely family, don't get me wrong. Mm. So the family was hugely supportive. But school was hard. And... Yeah, it was also, remember, it was also the apartheid era of South yeah. Africa. So whites only, boys school, macho, absolute disaster. Mm. And I didn't like it one little bit. And, you know, but you coped. Mm. And there were survival skills, which you kind of learned. But it wasn't much fun. And obviously, when I got the telescopes in the last couple of years of school, that was really helpful. But, um, you know, those are also, they take a bit of adaptation and things. Mm. Um, and, you know, they, they also they also tend to create a bit of barrier. And sometimes people say, well, you know, you're wearing a telescope, so you don't, I don't get eye contact with you. I said, well, if I'm not wearing my, my telescopes, I certainly won't get eye contact with anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. so it's, yeah. it's, it, these things are swings and roundabouts, and mm. it's always a bit of a trick. Mm. How how did you get into law? Well, I mean, I've always had, and I think this is one of the flip sides of actually having lousy eyesight. I've always had a very good memory, and I've always had an ability with to remember names and, and data and information mm-hmm. and stuff, which is very useful if you're a lawyer. And I've always had a sense of justice and an interest in what do we need to make the world a just place. And so that was a large part of it. In fact, when I was leaving school, I was originally looking at going straight into religious life. And I went to the Marion Hill Fathers in Pinetown. And one of them said to me, I mean, they were a little bit more subtle about it, but they basically said, essentially, you want to give up the world before you know anything about it. Get lost and come back in 20 years when you know something about what's going on. (laughs) Yeah, okay, fair enough. And... I didn't like it at the time, but in retrospect, it was probably the best piece of advice I've been given. So I went away, practiced law, got a doctorate, then came back to religious life. And that really helped because, I mean, law was also always a field of interest. Yeah. And so, you know, I actually got huge experience um, 
working in a variety of law firms, first in Johannesburg, um, small law firm um, in, the, in the inner city in Joburg, and then um, then working as a, a, an advocate, a barrister, as they call it, in New Zealand, mm. um, and then working as um, a solicitor, so an attorney in, uh, in New Zealand and working with a law firm. First with a big commercial law firm, then with a small firm. So it was a huge experience. And of course, meantime, getting a bit of the academic stuff under my belt, yeah. getting a doctorate and getting it published and all that stuff. Mm. So, yeah, it's been, um, it's certainly not been wasted time. But it also meant that I came to religious life quite a lot, lo quite a lot more mature mm. and with, and a bit cluey, you know. Mm. Certainly a bit cluier than I would have been if I'd actually gone <laughs> yes. in as a, as a, oh, as a 17 year old who yeah. didn't know what the hell I was doing. The, yeah. the clueiness keeps growing. <laughs> yeah, it does. It does. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. Lately, not lately, I think last year we had a conversation with our bishop. He basically said to us in the youth office, Why, what are you doing with? the Department of Spread, especially for young people. Right. And we were like, oh, okay, not really much. Um, what is it that we can do? Right. <laughs> you know, um, I think it goes back to what I just said. You kind of made it clear, let's not say inclusivity, but how can we not grow together, be one mm. church? And there's obviously a lot of challenges, like people who are hearing impaired, some people who don't have vision, some can't walk, and yep. all of these different yep. And sometimes you've got combos. Yes. And, and that itself is a different world. <laughs> that is mm. also a different world. So how do we, I don't want to say adjust, but how do we become this one family when to some extent we might not even know where to start? Because Honestly? me at home, I don't have any of these challenges. I don't know anyone who personally does. So I'm not necessarily inclined to say, let me study sign language, you know. So how do we then build this And I church? think this is the key. It's in, you know, when you said, I think the key was when you said, I don't actually have contacts and things. And I mm -hmm. think the key is actually making friends, making contacts, chatting to people. Mm -hmm. You know, there's obviously there is spread, of course, but there's also, you know, there are going to be loads of people. What part of, what, what part of the city are you in? I'm in Gatlehong in the East Rand. Okay. Mm. Um, because, so, I mean, I, I I think I might be wrong, but I have a suspicion that there's at least one school for people with disabilities out there. There's about three in my area. So mm. it would be quite good to go out there, meet mm. people, meet some of the kids, meet some of the teachers, mm. go and also maybe meet some of the, you know, the adult organizations of disabled people themselves getting in touch with those organizations and saying, look, you know, I'm actually interested in finding out more about how the church interacts. And I think mm. the fact that you actually come from a youth background, from a church background, and can say, look, I think provided you go in and say, not say, well, we're from the church and we're here to help. It's more about how is it that we can actually make the church a bigger and opener place. Mm -hmm. I think you'll find people who are really willing to be part of that conversation. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you, you, there are a lot of things where people are, um, you know, people have got almost hidden hurts. Mm -hmm. So you talk to people with intellectual disability and a lot of them say, why can't we go to communion? Mm -hmm. Because while canon law itself is actually quite nuanced about what what it means to have communion and it talks about you know people being able to understand what the body and blood of Christ is a lot of people have taken that and said well we can't let anybody with an intellectual disability come to mm. communion and mm. that's really been hurtful to a lot of people um so you know people who want commun communion and are able to get it should really have that ability and even in the even in the in the Western Church, I mean, mm. in the Eastern churches, it's slightly different because kids get communion from you know as soon as they're born. Mm. So you know, and so getting in touch with people in disability organisations and saying, you know, how is it that we can actually have starting the conversation, mm. saying where is 
where are you not dovetailing with your church? Mm. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of people who are kind of working in parallel in spaces. Uh, you know, I've been out in Kanyezi in Orlando West, and a lot of people, you know, their kids at the school there, um, and they're they're people who 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 are teaching there, and they're really struggling too because mm. they're in this kind of halfway limbo between. Um, Department of Infrastructure, Department of Education, yeah. Department of Health. So, you know, they're battling. So I think finding out more about these struggles and working out where that actually fits mm. is going to be key. And mm. there's so, as you say, there's so much out there. There are people out there, there are schools out there, there are organizations out there. And really, I think really just walking through the door and saying hi. Mm. Is, is probably the best mm. start. A certain kind of proactivity to say, yeah. I want to get to know people. I, I want to sort of decide to mm. to journey with people who I might not otherwise. Have, because these things uh, become, an, and because to. these things become a self an aggravating circle. You mm. know, I don't know anybody and therefore the paths diverge. Mm. And, you know, mm. there becomes a little world of people with disability who are really struggling to survive, you know, in a world which doesn't really understand them necessarily. Mm. Yeah. So I think getting those, breaking those barriers down and getting the conversations, bro you know, happening in the relationships started mm -hmm. and getting relationships in all kinds of areas, because as you say, there's lots of different people. And I mean, heck, South African Sign Language has now made it onto the books as the 12th yeah. official language. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's the kind of stuff that, what do we do about it? I mean, there's, mm. there's you know, there there's loads of deaf churches and things mm. out there. Yeah. And deaf parishes that have been doing their thing. And the question is how we actually how they're being integrated into the broader church. Yeah. Mm. Okay. And I mean, I think for for a lot of us who have disabilities, words like special tend to put our mm -hmm. hairs up because yeah. usually it means this is the leftovers we're going to give you because we couldn't actually be bothered to include you in in in, in with everybody else. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. And I don't know what spreads like. I haven't actually dealt with them. But I mean, I just, you know, sometimes those languages and that kind of terminology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, you can... <laughs> the, way, the way we talk about people yeah. is, has, you has to be, sometimes we have to I think, think about it. We end up finding ourselves talking about people with disabilities, disabilities like they're not even in the room. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think this is part of one of yeah. the things. So the question, I think the real question is communication and how mm. is it that we realize that we're all working on the same team? Mm rather than there's an us and the them, which we might include if you're really, really good. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> another thing I often found in, in conversations where people are trying to sort of be a bit more progressive and, in, and to use that word, which you didn't like earlier, inclusive, yeah. um, there's often a lot of talking about. Yeah. You often yes. find people are spoken about, people yeah. with disabilities spoken about, mm. poor people spoken about, yeah. uh, refugees not spoken about, about but exactly. not in the conversation yeah. speaking for themselves. As um, I like to say, on uh, when I sit on the Melbourne Council, uh, the Melbourne City Council Disability Advisory Committee, if you're not at the table, you're probably on the menu. What I have found is my area specifically. Right. Like I said, there's a few schools. There's school for the deaf, Gatlong School of the Deaf. Right. There's. Dugatole Elson School, which mm -hmm. I have noticed. I, okay. I'm not this way sure, I think. Okay. Um, it has people with Down syndrome. Right. And then there's Zbeleni. Mm -hmm. That one, I have no idea. Right. But I know that it's people with some kind of disability. Right. So all of these schools are in my area, yep. in my tiny area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it is... For a long time, there was a stigma yeah. when your child went to either one of these schools. Sure, mm. sure. Like, yeah. oh, why are they going there? It means yeah. they're mm. not smart mm. or yeah. anything mm. like yeah. that. So for them, regardless of any disability, yeah. if they go to a normal school, put that in inverted commas, mm. yep. then they are smart enough. And this, I think, is part of the problem too, because mm. then also remember that for the people themselves, apart from the stigma, there's also the question of, how do I know what it's like to relate in a society in a, to a, to people not, all of whom are not deaf, mm. have not got Down syndrome or whatever? 
um, because part of the issue is then because other you know it it then becomes everybody becomes funneled into a channel. One yeah. of the disability activists in Australia, I think, has actually referred to the polished pathway, so that you know specialized education tends to lead to specialized work things so that people yeah. don't actually ever have the sense that they could be part of a broader community and a broader society. Mm. Mm. And so part of the issue is, I mean, sure, I don't, you know, I don't say that you don't need on occasion. I mean, some people will need schools where they can actually have access to services that aren't mm. available elsewhere. But I do think that the more access people have to a broader range of people, the better. And the more, you know, the more people can, broader society can say, this is not somebody who's other. Yeah. So basically, let's add, since South African Sign Language is an official language, why don't we just add it to schools like we have yeah, in English? Exactly. Afrikaans, Zulu, mm -hmm. that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And how do we get, because I mean, it's, it's, it is a, it, I mean, sign languages, and there are not South African sign languages one of many mm -hmm. you know people like people tend to think that there's a kind of universal sign language yeah. which isn't so but you know you sign languages are huge and complex and they are i mean they're they're not easy they're visual languages but yes. they but it does mean you, you could express things in visual terms that you couldn't do say you know in in, in other languages mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of there's a lot of importance in sp of space of distance of all that kind of stuff in sign languages, mm -hmm. size of hand sign all that kind of stuff. So you know people really do need to get exposed to that kind of stuff. I think more and more because otherwise it remains something that becomes a kind of special interest and yes. uh, you know in in, mm. in 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 all the in all the wrong kinds of ways mm. I, I had a fascinating experience once in zimbabwe mm. the, this story reminded me of it mm. um we decided to replace our dining room chairs so we were we went to this area it's kind of an informal market but they've got a lot of furniture being made there and anyway we found this one shop we found the chairs we wanted and we made an order but we wanted quite a few extra so we knew they had to make extra for us so we, we placed this order and then every now and again we were going back to like check on them and just to see yeah, how the yeah, progress yeah. was and that yeah. kind of stuff just full of following up so the one day we were we were there and um the guy was working on the chair and he was facing away from me um and i went up to him and i wanted to greet him and i was like hey sir how, how how's the you know asked him how, like how's it going you know how's the how's the work going and he didn't respond at all mm -hmm. he just carried on working so i thought oh, maybe it's in english so i greeted him in shona you know i tried and he just, he was completely ignoring me and I got so upset. I was like, this guy's just blatantly, he's so rude, you know, how could he? <laughs> so I just went and sat down and said, I'll wait for the manager to come or whatever. And then we'll talk with him when he comes, you know. The manager arrives, <laughs> greets the guy in sign language. <laughs> <laughs> Right. I was like, oh no. Why did you go back? <laughs> yeah, like I'm sitting here getting so angry with this yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, he's deaf. And it turned out that all the workers there were deaf. Okay. Like they'd oh. employed everyone at this workshop was was deaf. And okay. they were actually speaking like an informal sign language. Right. Like a self developed right. sort of homegrown one. Okay. I mean it was clearly not recognizable as the other yeah, ones yeah. I've seen. Yeah. So it was just it was fascinating that this little workshop had sort of made a space, yes. you know, for deaf yes. um, carpenters. Yes. And that they'd, they'd found a way of working together and that kind of thing mm -hmm. and um, developed their own language, developed their own, yes. and, and kind of made the workshop so that they could work there. And I yeah, thought yeah. that was so great. And I was very embarrassed by my, <laughs> 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 my assumptions. <laughs> yes, and my judgment. So after that, I was like, so sorry. But you know, that's it. And I mean, I think we've all got stories like that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I remember... I remember, I think it was in Durban, and I was collecting money, actually. I was collecting money. I was working, uh, and there was a school of people with disabilities in Durban, and I did a round collecting money for them on the street corner. And, you know, somebody said to me, um, no, it was, the end of the, it was the end of the morning, and I was handing in my little, my little kennekes, and um, I was handing them in, and somebody said, not to me, of course, but to the person who was collecting the cans of us. Ah, oh, poor blind boy, what does he do all day? I said he studies law. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> if, uh, I, there's often a, a fair bit of insensitivity and in making fun of people yeah. with disabilities. I don't know if yeah, that, I mean, that sort I of thing has oh, happened oh, to heck, you know? a lot. I mean, mm. Australia actually it 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 got into it, you know it gets quite regularly into mm. um, physical abuse and Jeez, um, like. you know fairly, particularly in Sydney. I don't know why, but I found in Sydney I got a lot of you know, both physical and verbal abuse quite mm. regularly, mm. just walking along. Really? You know, you got a, I mean, no, my disability is not exactly hidden, but <laughs> so mm. it's, um, yeah, but it, it, it certainly is so. And I think that, I mean, I've, interestingly, I've never actually had that in South Africa and I've never had it in New Zealand. Mm, wow. But, yeah. It's been interesting walking around with you, like when we go... Like that time we went for a coffee in Melville and the car guards were like, oh, what's going on with your yeah. glasses? The glasses are so cool. They were like, yeah. there was almost a positive attention. About yeah, yeah, it, yeah. So. I mean, there was, there's a bit of that. I mean, yeah. you know, some people, some disabled people kind of would get, get a bit back up at that. But I tend to be OK with that because at least people are interested and they have a, a, you know, they have an interest in knowing what's mm. going on, which is nice. Mm. But, you know, it's, it's the sort of stuff where... Um, you get you get the beep retard yelled at you on the trains and <laughs> mm. things, which happens quite a lot in places like Sydney for some reason. Yeah. Do you think maybe it's people's insecurities or fears? Holy. That they just project. Yeah, I think it's a lot of that stuff going mm. on. And I think, you know, and I think people are you know, there there are environments where it's quite uncomfortable to be different and so yeah. I mean, you you know heck, this is Australia where, you know, refugees get sent to offshore hell holes to die. So, yeah. Mm. Sure. I'm just glad that I've heard something positive about South Africa. Sometimes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, because sometimes you, know, you hear the worst. Yeah, oh, sure. You hear the worst. Oh, you know, I mean, worst. And it, mm. it always feels good that at least there's something. Look, it's been a delight coming yeah. back to South Africa. I mean, there have been... There's certainly been, let's not pretend that we're in a perfect society, no, but I mean, not. you know, I, I think about it when I was, when I was here at the time of the transition to democracy mm. and that whole sort of end of apartheid era fear and stuff, that's gone. And there's, I mean, there's certainly the, the don't get me wrong, there's still crime and all the rest of it, but mm. the whole, the whole kind of public interaction the public space seems a lot seems to me anyway a lot healthier than it was when i was last year yeah. that's good to hear sometimes you, know you need the outsider perspective yeah I'll you know, the return say perspective. That because i think social media I'm, I'm i love tiktok so i'll always refer to it at some point um i've heard a lot of uh americans north americans people from england and all of that coming to South Africa for a visit and now ending up wanting to stay mm. in the country and say, no, South Africa mm. is beautiful. There's a lot of cultural differences, but we are like a beautiful melting point of melting pot of different cultures. And they see it in such a positive light. And I'm sitting here like, I want to get out of here. <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. No, so sure. that outsider perspective it, it kind of helps sometimes mm -hmm. because yeah. we get so engulfed in all of our negatives and all of our challenges mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. we end up not seeing the the beauty of, of what we have in this country. Oh, sure. And I mean, you know, some of the international stuff, the, you know, the, the case before the ICJ, mm -hmm. for example, that I thought was really quite, mm -hmm. you know, that was, a, that was a great move and well done. You know? Thank you. Yeah. And, you know, we had a bit of backlash with that. Yeah. Especially on social media, yeah. By a lot, of, some South Africans say we are starving here, but you're busy fighting in other countries. Mm. And they're like, mm. oh, so if we when during apartheid, if other people are like, we are starving here, why are you fighting? <laughs> We're not going to help you. It's kind of yeah. like a similar situation. That yeah. yes, as much as we have our own problems, yeah. it doesn't mean we have to ignore no. mm. exactly. other issues around the world. And if we can help, why not? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And it showed that we have the capacity to take a positive stance. Yeah. It showed that we have the capacity to make a really professional, you know, well argued presentation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I wish we, I wish we ran the whole country the way we we, <laughs> we developed that, that argument that case. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and we were like, "Where's that lawyer when we get into parliament?" Because we need stuff like that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. 
Well, thank you so much, Father, for joining us today. Mm, I think it's just been a pleasure. Mm. This conversation was needed. I think so as well. Yeah, okay. and I think I, I've got a little fire to mm. now actually get up and get say, there, let's yeah. build this yeah. church and not wait for somebody mm. else to and to start. And no yeah. longer have the us and them. Yeah. Moments. Yeah, and I mean, now people have got a bit of an idea of canon law. I remember when I was in Canada, there was um, a couple of guys who went down to back to the US they were living a lot of the people came across the border mm. and they came back across the border and the US border guard said to them what are you doing in Canada and so I said well I'm, we're studying what are you studying canon law is that like ballistics <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> people, everyone's going straight to the guns <laughs> yeah. um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about about some of your thoughts on spiritual accompaniment specifically yeah. of people with um, disabilities. Yeah, um, and I think that depends a lot on, you know, I mean, again, it's like any other interaction. What, you know, what does the person need? Where are they at? And again, I think it's like all spiritual accompaniment. The key with spiritual accompaniment is that you actually have to find out where the person's at in the first place mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what they need, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, what the issues are. Mm. You know, I've accompanied a couple of people with disability and it's, you know, it's not a, it's not a one size fits all and a lot of it just, but it, it's, it's not different to other kinds of spiritual yeah. accompaniment. A mm -hmm. lot of it is just, Sitting with a person, listening, what are their struggles? And you'll often find that their struggles and their worlds are very, very different to mm -hmm. yours. Yeah. And the mere fact that you've got a disability and they've got a disability doesn't necessarily make a difference. Although sometimes it makes for a solidarity because, mm. you know, everybody's used to pushing manure uphill with tweezers then. But, you know, at least you kind of, but, but you know, any, any spiritual accompaniment involves being with a person listening, finding out where they're at mm. and trying to then be there with them and walking with them. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, it requires a kind of a genuine relationship. Yeah. Um, exactly. And this is where listening. I'm thinking that if you're going to, if we're going to talk about how the church becomes more synodal, particularly in the disability context, mm -hmm. yeah, it really starts with building the relationships and making sure that people have, you know, that people know that it's, that, that they're actually safe to interact in yeah. their church and mm -hmm. that they're actually got a voice in it. Hmm. Yeah, that this is actually my church. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that I'm not a, and you're not a, a guest, guest here. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And that's where I think, you know, while it's well-intentioned, some of the language of hospitality, you know, hospitality to strangers is a good thing, but we're not hospitable, you know, we're not really hospitable to our own, our own or our... Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> In a sense, so, yeah. you know, that's, yeah. we, we're certainly hospitable to people who are, you know, for example, if you're non-Catholic, you're welcome to visit you, you know, we, we make, we, we make, you know, we make you feel at home. But, you know, I think the language of hospitality doesn't really work when you're talking about welcoming people into the church, which is which they're as much a part of as you. Mm, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I think in, in Bosco, when I was a volunteer, Father Dingani liked saying, don't feel at home, be at home. Yeah. Because mm. when, you, when you feel at home, you're still a guest. It tells yeah, you yeah, that you're yeah, not yeah. actually at yeah. home. So yes. you must be at home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And yeah. I think that's exactly the distinction I'm trying to capture. Yeah, mm -hmm. I like that. It goes back to what we've been saying that yep. we are the church. Mm -hmm, it's not mm -hmm. us and, and them. them. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So I think people getting to let that sink in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it also starts with our families at home. As soon as you have a child with disability, they're already different. Yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. they're treated different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So for them as well, they don't necessarily form part of the family. So I think that transcends and moves and into the, the whole thing. church. It's a whole new way of so thinking, yeah. So once you get that understanding that we are yeah. one, mm. then I think it opens the doors to so many other things. Amen. Exactly. Amen. You know, this is exactly right. Because, mm. I mean, the thing is that I think, and I think a lot of what you said earlier, a lot of people's attitude to disability is about fear. I could be like that and I don't want to be. Mm. Yeah. Whereas, sure. you know, if you actually understand the world that the other person lives in, yeah, sure, they've got limitations, but they may also have a lot of other strengths and things going mm. as well. And so the world is, you know, you can actually, 
it's not that you're seeing beyond the person's disability, but the disability is actually a part of them, which is a rounded humanity. And mm. I think people tend to focus on the disability and at the cost of the, you know, and, and say, well, you know, this is actually, you know, my disability is an integral part of who I am, but it's also, it's, 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 it's like also, but, well, it's also, but, well, so, I mean, I'm not going to say that because it's actually, it shapes the whole me. So mm. it's an integrated part of the whole me. So you can't say, well, I think beyond the disability to who you are, because that's not right either. Yeah. What you're actually saying is that somebody's disability, though, is not that they can't just be reduced to a cipher of being a disability. Mm -hmm. it, but the disability will obviously, you know, if I didn't have low vision, uh, you know, would I have a good memory? Probably not. Would I have, you know, would I have developed other things like my singing voice? You know, maybe I would have been a, a brilliant runner and a whatever, but yeah. it isn't like that. Mm -hmm. So you can't actually wish for somebody to be another person, mm -hmm. but you can say, who is this person actually? Rather than oh, there's a blind guy. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I, love that. I love I love the integrated the idea of an in, it's integrated. It, it's not like you reduce the person to it, but you understand it yep. as an integrated part Whole. of who yeah. they are. Yeah. And I think that applies to any area of accompaniment, yeah. really. Exactly, yeah, which is lovely. You know, yeah. Um, one of the questions we love to ask is, what is the good news? Mm -hmm. And I think the good news is that the really good news is that God loved us first and called us into union with God. Mm. And I think if that, you know, that's the truth of the exercises, it's the truth of the, um, it's the tr it's basically the truth that the church proclaims. Mm. But if we're going to live that, we actually have to take that seriously, that everybody has to be loved as God loves, mm -hmm. rather than as I love and as I can see from my partial mm. perspective. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. God Thank you. God loved us. Yeah. <laughs> that is definitely good news. That is definitely <laughs> very good news. <laughs> So thank you very much for joining us. We uh, hope you enjoyed that episode. Um, I don't know what did you what did you think about that conversation? I loved it. Mm -hmm. I loved it. You know the conversations that we've been having they're making me realign my faith, give it I think mm -hmm. a bit of more direction, different mm -hmm. perspectives, and I'm enjoying every single one of them. That's awesome. You know, this mm -hmm. one I, I don't know it how it, it it sparked a little flame under my my, my mm -hmm. feet mm -hmm. to There's kind of. Flame do more instead of speaking about it, you know? Okay, that's awesome. Yeah. And and maybe to like sort of get involved, we were speaking about sort of getting, yes. getting involved and, yes. and getting to know people and um, yeah, I think that's great. Maybe reducing some of the stigma and fear around yep, disability. Yeah, definitely. Well, so. Pedro just said he's ready to be a parent again. Mm -hmm. So maybe. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe sometime Changing soon, lives. you know? <laughs> but honestly, everybody, I am looking forward to many, many more conversations that we are about to have on this podcast. And I hope it is just as informative for you as it is for me. See you in episode five. <laughs>